Okay, today we're going to talk about Chapter 3, which is Consciousness and the Two-Track Mind. So we'll cover sleep and dreaming, um, and we'll start by ta talking about the biological basis of sleep a little bit. We'll move through the sleep stages, which are actually defined by different brain waves or brain activity at each stage. Then we'll talk about sleep deprivation and um, some of the implications of this. And we'll also talk about sleep disorders. Then we'll cover some theories of dreaming, and these are discussed in your text. So to start with the biological basis of sleep, we have circadian rhythms, and circa just means daily. So a circadian rhythm is this daily rhythm of sleep and wakefulness that we have. There are a couple of different sources of this daily rhythm. Uh, and you may ask yourself, you know, what is it that makes us sleep and makes us wake up? Well, it turns out part of that is from entrainment. And entrainment just means the rhythm synchronized with an external event. For instance, um, you know, seeing the moon outside could make you sleepy. The other piece is an endogenous rhythm, and in endogenous means born within. So that means that part of the rhythm is biologically generated within us. Even if you took all the cues away about what time it was or whether it was light or dark, you'd actually settle into a rhythm of sleep and wakefulness. So let's look at this a little more carefully, this biology of sleep. We know that sleep is controlled in part by the hypothalamus, and it's controlled in a particular location called the suprachiasmic nucleus, which you can see in the diagram below on the slide. Basically what happens is bright light that, uh, of course, we're exposed to during the day signals the nucleus to decrease melatonin, and that kind of disrupts sleep. So if uh, you're... Uh, normally stimulated by bright light in a natural way. In other words, if you're walking around outside during the day, that's fine. The problem comes in if you're like looking at this computer screen at a time when you should be asleep, that light's going to disrupt uh, and decrease melatonin and it will cause you to stay awake more than you should. The sleep stages are defined by brain waves, and although many people commonly believe that, um, your brain is inactive when you're sleeping. That couldn't be further from the truth. So what we're looking at here is the alpha stage. And this is kind of what I like to think of as the cusp of sleep. You're right on the edge of sleep. So you're awake, but you're relaxed. And at this point, your brain is still producing alpha waves. They're rapid and low amplitude. This is also called the hypnagogic state. It's kind of when you're nodding off and then you'll wake up again, that kind of odd in-between state. Now, once you get past alpha, you're actually in the sleep stages. There are three non-REM or non-rapid eye movement stages. Non-REM 1 is defined by theta waves, and we'll see a picture of this just in our next slide. Non-REM 2 is sleep spindles, and non-REM 3 are delta waves. And as you move from 1 to 3, you're getting into deeper and deeper sleep. These are called non-REM or non-rapid eye movement stages because they are not associated with dreaming. Dream sleep is REM sleep. So there's this one rapid eye movement stage that's closely associated with dreaming. So when you're awake, we see beta waves. When you're kind of drowsy and relaxed, we'll see alphas. And then as sleep gets deeper and deeper, you can see obviously the uh, change in patterns. When you see the delta waves in stage non-REM 3, you're in the deepest sleep. And then in REM sleep, you see kind of fast random waves. So let's talk about what happens with sleep deprivation and sleep disorders, especially in shift work. What we know about shift work, in other words, work where people usually work eight hours in the morning, in the afternoon, or at night, we know that working a shift, the same one for three weeks, is much less stressful than the usual one-week shift. Unfortunately, the most common shift in the United States is called swing shift. So you will work 
for instance, mornings for a week, and then you'll change to a different shift. So it's better if you can stay on the same shift. Also, if you just follow the clock when setting the shift sequence, that helps people quite a bit. So instead of changing from morning shift all the way to night shift, you would have morning shift for three weeks, then afternoon for three weeks, then night for three weeks, and then back for morning. So that basically helps your body adjust. What happens when we uh, don't do this, when we work short shifts that are out of sync with the clock? We see an increase in uh, cardiac disorders, digestive disorders, and also social stress, which just basically means you have more problems with people in your life. If you want, you can see more about this uh, relationship between swing shifts and health by just typing in late shift health into YouTube. Let's talk about sleep disorders for a minute. Sleep apnea is actually a more serious disorder than many people realize. During apnea, the person wakes up suddenly and they're breathless and they may actually sit up really quickly in bed. Typically they'll fall back asleep and they don't even um, remember in the morning that they woke up. And this can happen many times during the night. Sleep apnea is often uh, caught by someone's family members or their partner because the person suffering from it, as I said, is often unaware. So breathing actually stops, and as you would guess, it puts quite a bit of stress on your body. If you go to YouTube and type in Shack Attacks Sleep Apnea, and that's S-H-A-Q, Shack Attacks Sleep Apnea, A-P-N-E-A, -E type that into YouTube and you'll see a good short video on sleep apnea. The second disorder is narcolepsy, and narcolepsy is simply sudden, unpredictable daytime attacks of sleepiness. Uh, in narcolepsy, the person cannot control the onset of the attacks, and actually strong emotion, whether good or bad, can uh, trigger an onset of narcolepsy. To take a look at um, what narcolepsy looks like, you can go to YouTube and type in Sleepy Man National Geographic Narcolepsy, D-D-E-E, Dowd, D-A-U-D, and it'll take you to a famous case study of a narcoleptic. Non-REM 3 disorders are in general less serious than the ones we just talked about and these are called non-REM 3 because that's the sleep stage where they occur. They include night terrors and sleepwalking. Both of these occur in the deepest phase of sleep. So sleepwalking actually occurs when the person is showing these delta waves. In contrast, sleep talking can occur at any stage. There is a genetic component in this, as there is in narcolepsy. Sleepwalking occurs just about any time during the lifespan, but it's actually quite common in childhood, and it's considered harmless. The only thing that you need to watch out for is, of course, if the child is in an upstairs bedroom, they may wander into the stairs, down the stairs, so you would um, make sure that they slept on the first floor and that the doors are all locked so they can't kind of get out. It's usually pretty simple movements like sitting up or walking around. <coughs> Pardon me. So the next topic is dreaming, and we'll talk about some theories of dreaming. These are all in, nicely summarized in a table in your text. And, of course, dreaming is occurring um, during REM sleep, and there's um, pretty good agreement on that among psychologists. The first theory is called Freud's wish fulfillment theory. And Freud, if you remember, uh, believed that we are kind of driven by these unconscious wishes and desires. So it's not surprising that he thought a lot of these unconscious wishes came out through dreams. Now to Freud, there are two levels to a dream. The manifest, which just means apparent content, versus latent, which means hidden content. Um, to Freud, this manifest content then is the surface content of the dream and latent is hidden. So to Freud, manifest content might mean, um, let's say, that you dream that you dive into a pool. 
To Freud, that's the manifest content, but the latent or hidden meaning to him, water symbolizes birth or a new start. So he would say if you dream of diving into the pool, you're actually thinking of getting a fresh start in some life domain. In contrast, information processing is much more kind of pragmatic and just looks at the fact that dreams help you consolidate memories or remember information. That's why if you're having problems remembering information, whether it's before a job interview or before you have an exam, it's always a great idea to look over your notes last thing and then kind of sleep, sleep on it. If you want to learn more about this particular theory, you can go to YouTube and just type in NOVA, N-O-V-A, Science Now, 37 Sleep. And so if you stop um, this video and go ahead and do that, it'll give you some more information on this. And if you want, you can start that video around four minutes, although um, after four minutes it goes straight into this information processing theory. The third theory is a physiological function, and this physiological function theory suggests that dreams just stimulate neural pathways and kind of keep pathways active during the night. So it's a pretty straightforward biological view of dreams. The fourth is a little more complex. The neural activation theory suggests that uh, dreams result when lower brain centers send kind of random signals to your cortex. And remember, the cortex is that higher um, function of the brain. And so the cortex job is to try to take all this random information and try to weave it into a dream. So neural activation actually explains some of those odd dreams you may have where um, maybe there are people from different parts of your life who've never met or are sitting around a table. Uh, and you kind of usually you'll actually forget those dreams unless you're interrupted right in the middle of those by your alarm clock or someone waking you up because they're usually pretty odd. Cognitive development theory is the only theory that looks at how dreams change as we age. And it suggests that dreams reflect changes in knowledge and maturation. And so this theory suggests that children actually dream differently than us. In fact, there's some research that suggests that children often, when they report their dreams, it's often as if they're reporting a slideshow rather than a continuous dream. So the nature of dreams is different for little ones. That concludes this particular section for um, Chapter 3, Theory of Dreaming, and hope you enjoyed this presentation.